Ethiopia to avoid coming close to thresholds. And we define this conceptually by looking at Earth system processes at the regional to global scale, which could generate unacceptable large-scale discontinuities related to thresholds, and putting the planetary boundary level for that process at the downstream end of the uncertainty zone. So we made it quite simple for ourselves, saying that the, there is a zone of uncertainty largely related to unknowns in science, and placing the boundary at that point. We also recognize that many processes don't show evidence so far of planetary boundary or nonlinear behaviors, but that these enter danger zones where they can have feedback mechanisms on those with clear thresholds or where you can generate tipping points at the lower scale and if they happen in simultaneously in enough places on the planet, they would be a global concern. So we have then based on this tried to find the processes that could qualify. What are the processes that we have to be guardians of? And we can so far identify nine. And again, a proposition, it may end up being eight or 11, but these are the nine that we so far can identify, of which a couple of them we believe have clear threshold behavior, climate change, ocean acidification potentially, and a number of them have mixed behaviors or even more strictly behaviors as slow changing variables which do not have evidence of large scale thresholds. And the nine are as seen here. Uh, what is interesting in my mind is that they're not 25, um, but they're not two or three either. The fact that this group of scientists at least identifies nine big processes at the Earth system scale within which we could, the hypothesis being, have an opportunity for safe development in the future. We have made a first effort of quantifying seven of them. This is a very um, uh, courageous, uh, potentially even risky business. And um, clearly this morning shows and I think emphasized the fact that we still remain with many uncertainties. I won't go through all of these. I don't have time for that. But not surprisingly, climate change is one of them. Um, but also ocean acidification, which was very well uh, described by, by Sam just now. But perhaps surprisingly, we do believe that processes like fresh water use, land system change, and rate of biodiversity loss, which provide the underlying resilience to buffer stresses in systems that have clear thresholds, do qualify as, as boundaries. And just to give a little example of, of the logic here, which are presented in this summary table in, in this Nature feature article, for biodiversity loss, for example, which may be one of those that are less um, obvious, we start off by, by building on the evidence that we face a situation of massive extinction uh, at, at this moment in time. That biodiversity is a key to functional diversity and therefore to resilience, and that we have examples of biodiversity triggered thresholds at the local level, that we are today in a very unsustainable 100 to 1,000 times the background rate of loss of species in, uh, in the current situation. We take a control variable, which is the only one that we could find as a proxy for biodiversity loss, namely extinctions per million species per year, and define, based on expert solicitation, a level which in this case proposed to be, as a first best guess, 10 times the natural background rate, i.e. 10 extinctions per million species per year. Same goes for global freshwater use, which is another parameter where we have huge evidence of massive, unsustainable overuse of freshwater. We know that we have sustainable limits at the global level. We define this to secure both freshwater and aquatic systems, soil moisture and moisture feedback, and suggest a parameter based on that in terms of consumptive use of freshwater in rivers. Climate change, I won't go into that, just to say that we do um, build the argument consistently with the IPCC fourth assessment, but also building in a boundary proposition based on the latest science on growing risks that the climate actually is more sensitive to warming than we, to forcing than we previously thought, and taking a double parameter, both in terms of forcing in watts per square meter and in concentration of greenhouse gases and putting that at 350 ppm CO2, which is roughly 400 ppm CO2 equivalents. So these are examples of, of um, how we've reasoned to come to these. Of course, they interact, and that's one of the, I think, very important contributions of this work, recognizing that 
the battleground on climate change is probably moving away from emissions to stewardship of ecosystems, which is illustrated here by Peter Snyder's work that if you chop down or lose the Amazon rainforest, you actually get temperature connectivities across the planet with warmings all the way into Central Asia. So interconnectedness is a complexity of a planetary boundaries concept, but it also shows the need to understand Earth system interactions among different boundary processes. How have these changed over time? Well, if you do a timeline effort uh, and putting pre-industrial levels as your reference point, you show clear that in the 50s, we were in the safe space of all boundaries that we have data for. We transgressed the nitrogen boundary in the 70s, climate change boundary in the 80s, 90s, and today we do, so say, based on this first assumption, assess that we've transgressed three of the boundaries, loss of biodiversity, the rate of the biodiversity loss of nitrogen and then climate change. We are approaching boundaries on phosphorus, freshwater use, and acidity, and we don't know, of course, the big scientific question, how long can we overshoot before coming cross threshold that we don't want to cross. So I'm concluding um, this very rapid overview of, of this work then. Well, I think we, we all agree, and this morning really corroborates and supports that, that we have a new situation in terms of raising the challenge of global change into the global Earth system scale. I think we may dare, as scientific community, to talk of the Holocene state as a desired stable state, and that the, this state provides the preconditions for social and economic development. We therefore need a new approach to sustainable development. We are not taking that backcasting approach away from thresholds. We're rather still pushing ourselves forward in an incremental way. And this may be a proposition that a framework on boundaries may be one step towards this new definition in a positive way that instead of just talking about limits to growth, we say, well, obviously the planet must have some kind of boundaries within which we have to operate safely. And let's try to find the trajectories within that safe space. It's also clear, and, and, and an honest testimony from myself and all co author this is a proof of concept. It is a way of, of triggering and challenging and starting a discussion. There is a large set of unknowns here which, of course, are related to understanding of threshold dynamics, the boundary interactions and feedbacks, and, and understanding the Earth as one whole system, the spatial variability and patchiness, and the overshoot question. And final two conclusions, then. One is, well, of course, if this was taken seriously, it no doubt has very large implications for policy and governance. It, it, it in my mind, redefines global environmental governance and it redefines very much of the policy challenges we're facing. And no doubt are there many uncertainties and a lot of questions arising, but I think as many of us would always want to conclude in these kind of scientific talks, despite all these, it just gives another argument, scientifically founded argument, that we probably have to act even more decisively than in the past, because when you take the broad systems perspective, the conclusion is that the system is even more sensitive than we previously thought, and that the pressures go across so many processes that we cannot allow ourselves anymore to just do climate by itself or biodiversity by itself. And, and acting now is, is clearly necessary. So this science is not, so to say, mature yet. It can certainly guide policy on, for example, the climate scene. And I'm, and I'm sure that you, Miles, will, will add here on, on how a, a more profound approach focusing on, on mitigation pathways can strengthen the arguments of this more upstream academic analysis of thresholds we want to avoid. Thanks. I'll stop there.